Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Um, so we're going to be doing some momentum free response practice. This is actually the momentum progress check and momentum is unit five on AP classroom, even though it's the first one we did. So we're going to just jump in and get right to it, just like we have been doing. I'm going to check back every so often to see if people have questions so you can ask your questions in that question and answer section all right um so in this first question we have it looks like a block of mass x sliding down a ramp and then there's this block of mass y down here and it looks like they collide and move off together so before i get into this problem I see that I have this like change in height here, which usually means I'm going to need to do some type of energy conservation. And then there's a collision here, which definitely means I'm going to need to look at momentum conservation. And I'm just going to write myself a note that this energy conservation here is going to go from potential to kinetic. And I'm talking about only a block X. I don't know if kinetic energy is going to be conserved in the collision yet? Probably not. So that energy conservation part is just going to think about X. OK, so I like to do that with any diagram that I see. That way, if the question starts to ask about energy conservation and momentum, I already have kind of a good idea of what I might need to do based on the diagrams. So I have a solid block uh, X of mass MX placed at different locations along a curved ramp. At the bottom is a solid block mass MY that rests on a surface. Figure one shows the block before it's released. And we have to determine graphically the relationship between the release height and the speed at which the two block system travels after the blocks collide. Figure two shows both blocks after the collision. Friction is negligible. Awesome. So it looks like they do stick together, which means in my momentum conservation equation, if I need it, it's going to go from MX VX to both blocks together, traveling at whatever speed they're traveling at after the collision. So the first question says state the basic physics principles, laws, or equations that the student should use to graphically determine the relationship. So the physics principles um, and laws, that's going to be like your conservation uh, principles. So conservation of momentum, conservation of energy. Your laws are really talking about Newton's laws. So that's going to be like forces. Now, I already talked about how I can use energy and momentum in this problem. So that's what I'm going to write as my end uh, uh, answer. So I'm going to write energy conservation and momentum conservation. And I definitely need to use both since I'm comparing that initial launch height to the speed after the collision. So I definitely need that conservation of momentum part. Okay. All right, so then I need to derive an equation that relates the initial release height of block X and the speed VS of the two block system after the collision in terms of MX, MY, and any fundamental constant. So that's like G. So I can have height, I can have my two masses, and I can have G. That's it. Okay. So using the answer from above, the energy conservation, then momentum conservation, I can go ahead and write out my equation. Okay? Now I know a lot of you struggle with the deriving equations part, and I'm okay with that for this year because I don't think deriving equations is going to be a huge part of the exam since you guys are expected to be able to type in your answers. Okay? So like I said, we're going to start with energy conservation. Okay? And this is for the block X Earth system. Remember, we need the Earth in our system so that we can have gravitational potential energy. So we start with the gravitational potential energy of block X, and that converts to the kinetic energy of block X. And remember, this is occurring before the collision. 
So the initial potential energy of X is going to be M X G and that capital H X. And then the kinetic energy after is one half M X um, or at the bottom of the hill. And that's a good variable for this. Let's call this V X squared. Now we need this V X from this equation because that's going to give us the speed of block X before the collision, which we need so we can do conservation of momentum. Okay. So the MXs are on both sides so they can cancel, which means that VX ends up being the square root of 2GHX. Okay. So I multiplied both sides by 2, then took a square root. So now that I've done energy conservation, I can do momentum conservation okay and it's block x moving initially and then both blocks moving with some final velocity which they say use the variable vs so that's why i wrote that it is vs now i can't use vx but i know what vx is so i have mx square root of 2ghx is the two masses combined and they're different masses, so I can't combine those into like a 2m or anything because that would just be way too convenient. And I also can't cancel out an mx. Okay, that mx has to stay because it's not in every single term. So I'm going to divide by everything in the parentheses and I get a final answer, um, which is not pretty whatsoever. So mx square root of 2ghx all over mx plus my and that is my final speed so again i cannot cancel the mx's because they're not in every term and this is my final answer it's not pretty but there it is okay so i'm going to check the chat and see if there are any questions it does not look like there are awesome cool Okay, let's continue on. Now, the next part of this problem is designing an experimental procedure. This is not on the AP exam this year. Yay! Okay, but in the table below, we'd list the quantities, associated symbols that would be measured in our experiment to um, and the equipment we would use. So remember, we're trying to compare HX to the final speed. So the initial height to the final speed of both blocks after the collision. So really, we can fill in this table using this equation up here. So we need the mass of X, the mass of Y. We need the initial height and should probably write that out. Initial height and the final speed of both blocks. Okay. And it says here that we don't need to fill in addi any additional rows or every row rather. So the symbol for mass X is MX, this is MY, this was HX, and this was VS. Again, I'm just taking it right from this equation. I don't need to experimentally find G because I can assume that that's already known. So equipment for measuring mass, we use a scale. Equipment for measuring height, we use a meter stick. And equipment for measuring velocity, we can use a motion sensor. And that's really the best thing. So the motion sensor are those B spies that we used in class. They help measure velocity. Okay. Then what we would do is describe an overall procedure. So I'm just going to talk it out. I'm not going to write it down because, again, this isn't on the AP exam. But what we do is we would measure the initial masses of both um we would make sure to set mass y at the same location at the bottom of the hill every time we would vary the initial height um say by five centimeters every time and then use a motion sensor to determine the final speed of both blocks um at, after they collide 
Um, and then we would repeat it multiple times for every trial, and that's how we get rid of this experimental uncertainty part. Okay. And what's great is they actually don't make you then go into what you would actually have to graph to determine the relationship. But what if they did ask that, you could usually just say graph the height versus the velocity. Okay. And since the height versus the velocity, if we look at our equation, the velocity is proportional to the square root of hx. Um, so we should see some type of square root curve kind of going on based on our equation here. I, again, we're not asked to do that though in this problem, but that is something that you may be asked, you may be given an equation on the AP exam and asked to verify whether a graph matches or something like that. So it would probably be a good idea to have, um, you know, a cheat sheet with a table where you have like the equation relationship, meaning like this, the relationship name, um, kind of like your if then statements that we do, and then maybe um, an example graph of what that would look like. Um, and I can actually, I'm going to write myself a note right now to do that for you guys. Um, so I'm not going to write myself a note. I'm going to take a picture of it. And I will um, kind of create a sample one of that for you guys. Okay, continuing on with this problem. Actually, let me see if there's questions first. Boop -boop. No questions. You guys got it. Yay! Or you don't know what to ask, and that's totally fine too. Continuing on. Okay. So we have a different block, block W, uh, colliding with block Z. So two different blocks now. Again, we have energy, conservation, and momentum conservation and it's unknown whether this is elastic which remember means the kinetic energy is the same before and after or inelastic okay because they are going to bounce off of each other so we're unsure of whether or not it's elastic or inelastic so the students repeat the experiment but replace both x and y with w and z as shown Block W and Z have identical mass. When the experiment is conducted, the students observe the blocks do not stick together. The student predicts that the collision is perfectly elastic. Why aren't you letting me write? Hold on, we're having technical difficulties. Okay, now we got it. Perfectly elastic. So that means the kinetic energy initially before the collision is going to equal the kinetic energy after. So really the kinetic energy of block W beforehand should equal the kinetic energy of W plus the kinetic energy of Z afterwards. Okay. So they then collect data about the actual speeds of both the blocks. So we have the actual speed of W after, the actual speed of Z after, and the predicted speed of Z after. Okay. So this is the predicted speed is if this is an elastic collision. Okay. So what I'm noticing is that all of the velocities in this center column are less than the predicted velocities, which tells me that this collision is probably not elastic, that there was some loss of kinetic energy because of sound creation or something like that. Okay, so the question says, why does the predicted speed of block Z after the collision not agree with the actual speed? Okay, so again, we can kind of just talk about what I just said. So this collision is in elastic. Okay. The system loses 
some kinetic energy to, I don't know, um, external forces or sound creation. which causes Z to be slower than expected. Uh, that's not how you spell expect. Yes, mm, very bad at spelling. Okay. So why is speed Z lower? Because we've lost some energy, which means our collision is inelastic. Why have we lost some energy? Because of sound creation. You could also say um, because the internal, which is just heat energy of both blocks increases. You could say work done deforming the blocks slightly anything that really talks about a loss of energy because of you know some sort of work done or you know loss of energy because of sound or heat because it's turned into some non-mechanical form of energy meaning non-kinetic or non-potential uh, and that's actually the end of this problem so let me go back and see if anyone has questions it's not looking like it. So there's one more problem that we're going to go over. And that one more problem is actually a paragraph response problem, which will be on this year's AP exam, meaning the type of problem will be on the AP exam, not this exact problem. That would that would be actually really awesome. Um, so we have a before bounce and an after bounce so it looks like we're gonna have to be dealing with maybe some energy because we have a change in height and then maybe some momentum or something like that okay we got angles which means we need components Ooh. um so i'm just gonna draw in my triangle really quick um, so this component would be the sine, this component would be the cosine, and then afterwards this would be sine and cosine. So one thing I noticed right away is that these horizontal components here that I drew in, these arrows, they look exactly the same, which tells me that the motion in the x direction is not changing. But it looks like the y direction we're moving down and then moving up so there is a change in motion in the y direction and that's caused by this interaction with the floor so we have a ball thrown toward the ground the figure shows the direction of the ball before it reaches the ground and the direction of the ball after it bounces after the bounce the ball leaves the ground with the same speed that it had before so v v those are the same the angle between the ground is positive positive directions are indicated so up is positive, right is positive. On each grid below, or each grid below represents a component of the change in momentum. So change in momentum, that's force times time, mass times change in velocity, P final minus P initial, uh, as a result of the bounce. In each grid, draw a vector to indicate the direction and relative magnitude change of the ball as a result of the bounce. If there is no change in momentum for a given component, right? No change. So the reason why we're talking about components is because momentum is a vector. So we have to look at the X and Y direction separately. Now, momentum is based on mass times change in velocity. So I would look at the mass times the change in velocity in the X direction or the mass times the change in velocity in the Y direction. So in the X direction, like I said, these two arrows horizontally are exactly the same. Okay, which means there is no change 
horizontally. And that makes sense because the only force that this ball is going to experience is an upward force from the ground. There's no horizontal force that the ground is going to apply to change the momentum in that direction. So now we have the vertical component. So how does the vertical component change? Well, we can think about it kind of logically. We can logic our way through it and we can say, OK, well, the ball was traveling downwards and then travels upwards. So that must have meant it had an upward force acting on it. Okay, and the change in momentum has the same direction as that external force. So that must mean we have an upward vertical component. Or we can think about it graphically. Now, change in momentum is P final minus P initial or mass times V final minus V initial. Okay, well, how do we graphically do subtraction? We essentially stack arrows on top of each other. Okay, so V final is an upward arrow, okay, minus V initial, which is a downward arrow, okay, but subtracting is just the same thing as adding a negative. Well, what's the negative of down? Up. So I have an up plus an up, which is just going to give me a big up. So again, giving a vertical component that is upwards. It's kind of a strange way to think about it. But if you're more of a visual person, then that might work for you. If you're more of like an equation person, then the idea that the upward force from the floor is causing the change in momentum, so the change in momentum has to also be upwards, that might work better for you. Okay, so let me check for questions. Not seeing any questions. Again, if you have them, ask them. You don't have to wait until I say, what are your questions? All right, so now the next part. So it looks like I have a before bounce and an after bounce. So again, I might be looking at energy conservation and you know, there's a collision happening here, so I might have some momentum. All right, but I'm not gonna say momentum conservation because the floor isn't really going to move, right? Which means momentum's probably not going to be conserved. Also, I'm noticing that this ball is coming to a different height, which means I've lost some energy. So a ball of mass M is released from rest at a height H1 above the ground. After the ball reaches the ground, it bounces and travels to a height H2 above the ground as shown in the figure. In a clear, coherent paragraph length response, it may that may also contain equations and drawings explained using conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. So we definitely need to mention these two things, why H2 is less than H1. So why is this height less than this? Okay, so I'm gonna, before I even get to a, um, paragraph, I'm going to kind of write myself out some bulleted notes. So I'm going to say um, energy is conserved in the ball earth system as the ball falls. Okay. The floor exerts an external force uh, decreasing the total energy. Okay, so this also means momentum is not conserved in collision. Okay, so the velocity of the ball after is less. Okay. Um, and then we still have energy conserved up in the ball earth system, but there's less total energy. Um, so we reach a less height. Okay. And I've mentioned conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. I've started all the way at be the beginning and kind of explained 
all the way through to the end. So now I'm going to put that in a paragraph, okay? So I'm going to say before the bounce, energy is conserved in the ball earth system. And remember, I need to include the earth in my system so that the earth or so that I can take into account uh, gravitational potential energy. Otherwise, the earth is an external force or gravity is an external force and it makes things kind of complicated. Uh, as potential energy uh, converts to kinetic energy. Okay. Um, during the bounce, um, the floor exerts an external, external force on the ball decreasing the ball's kinetic energy. This also means um, that momentum is not conserved in the collision as only the ball is moving before and after. Okay, so I talked about this no I talked about this one I talked about this one okay so now I'm going to talk about the v ball after his last so this means the ball rebounds that's a good word rebounds with less speed even though energy is still conserved after the bounce. There is less total energy, so the ball will reach a lower height, a height, causing H2 to be less than H1. Okay. And I, I want to make sure that I include what I'm actually supposed to prove, right? So they tell me why is this true? So I should probably include that statement in my um, paragraph. All right, so I talked about V-ball being less. I talked about energy being conserved again. Less energy means less height. Okay. All right, so I'm just going to run through the scoring guideline for this paragraph part because to show you guys that even though some of this stuff you wouldn't think to mention, like you might not think to mention the momentum. It's important that you do anytime there's a collision or a bounce or something like that because it's a part of the scoring guide. So let me scroll over to here and find the scoring guide for this part. Okay. All right. We got that part right. All right. So that paragraph is worth five points. That's probably going to be the case on these paragraph questions and the paragraph 15 minutes to do and I, I think that took me a little bit less than 15 minutes so that's good okay so five points we get one point for indicating that the collision of the ball with the ground is inelastic 
I didn't exactly say that, but I did mention the speed was less. Mm, that's awkward. So I didn't mention this, so I'm not going to give myself a point. I didn't get full credit on this. All right. So see, even me, a physics teacher, it's tough to get full credit on these paragraph responses. Okay. But that doesn't mean you guys can't. You guys are great. Uh, one point is earned for indicating the momentum of the ball before is not the same. I did that. At one point is earned for stating kinetic energy of the ball immediately before the bounce is not the same. I don't know if I actually stated that. I stated the speeds would be less. Okay. I think so. If I was an AP reader and you say that the speeds are less or something like that, I would give you this point, but maybe not this point. So a lot of times on AP rubrics, it'll say implicitly or explicitly, meaning you imply the kinetic energy is less or you actually say it, and you can imply the kinetic energy is less by saying that the speed is less. I get one point for stating that some of the mechanical energy of the ball or earth is converted to non-mechanical energy, which is by, okay, I mentioned that. Um, and one point is earned for a logical, relevant, and internally consistent argument that addresses the required argument or question asked and follows the guidelines described. Okay, so basically this last point is like, you have a paragraph that A answers the question, B doesn't contradict itself, which some of you have done, so watch out for that. Reread your paragraphs. Um, and C is on topic. Like you're not just like randomly, you're not using random words that you made up. So I got a four out of five on this because I forgot this inelastic part. Okay. Now, just because I didn't get full credit on this question doesn't mean that I wouldn't be able to get a five. That's one thing that the AP physics exam is really good about um, is you don't have to get like 100% of the points to get a five. Okay? Like we've been doing all year, most of the time, um, you know, something like around a 75, 80% of the points, that's going to get you a five. And that's still going to be true um, on this year's exam. And it says so in the testing guide. Um, and somebody asked, why is momentum not conserved? So the reason why momentum isn't conserved in the collision with the floor is because our system we defined as the ball. I don't even know where the problem is. There it is. Um, when we're talking about a collision like this, Okay. Our system is defined as the ball, really, or the ball on the earth. So when we bounce off, this floor exerts an external force, which means that that floor exerts an impulse on the ball. And if there's an impulse acting on the ball, then there must be a change in momentum of the ball. We can also think of it this way. Initially, the ball has a momentum that is downward. Afterwards, the ball has a momentum upwards and the floor still has zero momentum okay so even though like the value might not change even if we say bounce back to the same height like we did in the beginning of this problem this direction changed which means there was a change in momentum because momentum is a vector and direction matters okay so the only time momentum is really going to be conserved is when you have two objects colliding um, and there's not a change in direction of the momentum of the system. Okay. Whereas in this case, there is a change in direction, so that means there is a change in momentum. Okay. Are there any other questions before we sign off for today? Anything? No? Okay. Well, we're going to do this again tomorrow, but with unit four, which is energy. I sent you guys out a schedule um, kind of for the rest of the lives that are just going to be some practice problems and going over the two types of problems on this exam. So I will see you guys tomorrow, same time, 1 p.m., because that seems to work well for everybody. All right. Bye.